You're in your galactic space cruiser on your way to Outpost 52, delivering supplies for the small colony there. When alarms begin going off, you scan your displays, but something catches your eye before you can work out what's happening. You don't need a view screen, as the front section of your ship is transparent, like a one-way mirror. A colossal orange and purple cloud is sweeping towards you. There's no time to analyze it. You put the ship into a dive, as steep as it will go. The alarms go crazy, but you're too focused on getting out of danger. The ship rattles, and you think it will break up. But your ship is fast and powerful, and somehow you manage to get underneath it. You look up and see the gigantic plasma cloud go soaring past. Curiosity has bitten you, and you decide to follow it. You program your computer to analyze it. Soon the information is coming back, and you can't believe what it's telling you. This plasma cloud is a wrecker of galaxies. It and others like it have been ending galaxies before their time. You recall your studies back on Earth when you were just a young pilot. There have been studies as far back as the 21st century as to why galaxies were mysteriously ceasing the formation of new stars, causing them to end ultimately. Stars form from thick clouds of gas that have become extremely cold. They condense and, over time, collapse into solid compact matter. There's a famous photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Most people have seen it. It's called the Pillars of Creation. It's the Eagle Nebula, where stars are forming. They call these environments star nurseries. It's a pretty cute concept if you think about it. But there's a bad guy lurking, and you're following it. It's a vast star wrecker. The wrecker rushes in and sweeps the gas out of these star-forming galaxies at an accelerated rate, preventing stars from forming in the first place. It's like a giant broom. But rather than cleaning up, it's ceasing up, bringing new galaxies to a premature end. Now that you know how dangerous it is, it's best to hang back a bit. Let's see if we can see it in action from a safe distance. It had been a long-standing mystery why some galaxies don't birth new stars. The star wrecker is smart. It hangs around large galaxy clusters. There's one in particular, the Virgo cluster. This is the one that scientists studied and came across the star wrecker. The nearby Virgo cluster is 7 million light years across and contains thousands of galaxies. When I say nearby, it's about 65 million light years from us. Not exactly a weekend space cruise away, but it's pretty close in galactic terms. The cluster hurtles through the superheated plasma at speeds of up to a million miles per hour. The cluster forms the basis for the large Virgo supercluster, of which the local group, where our Milky Way resides, is a member. Its proximity to us makes it easier for scientists to study. It's also one of the most extreme regions of the universe that we know of, currently. Who knows what else is out there? The Virgo cluster is also unusual, as it's still forming new stars. And we can observe them, such as in the famous Hubble nursery photo. A galaxy in this cluster is called the Messier 87. It was discovered way back in 1781 by a French astronomer named Charles Messier. It looked a bit fuzzy to him, so he called it a nebula, a nebula without stars. More information on what it was couldn't be ascertained until the 1920s. Messier was well respected and in his lifetime discovered 13 comets. He was born in rural France, the 10th of 12 children. When he was 14, he witnessed a tremendous six-tailed comet in 1744. It was astonishing and was visible to the naked eye for several months. Its effects were dramatic and unusual. It was so bright that it's been recorded as the sixth brightest in history. Four years later, young Charles saw a solar eclipse from his hometown on the 25th of July, 1748. He knew then that he wanted to explore the world of astronomy. It was meant to be. A lunar crater and an asteroid have been named after him. Nothing is mighty, however, like the Messier 87 or M87. It's a supergiant elliptical galaxy with trillions of stars. It's the second brightest galaxy within the northern Virgo cluster making it popular amongst astronomers and amateur enthusiasts. Elliptical galaxies are older, low-mass stars with minimal star formation activity. Large numbers of globular clusters surround them. They make up roughly 10 to 15% of the Virgo supercluster. M87 has a supermassive black hole at its core. 
The black hole was photographed using data collected in 2017 by the Event Horizon Telescope, EHT. It was announced excitedly to the world in 2019. In March 2021, the EHT collaboration revealed a polarized-based image of the black hole for the first time. It was a pretty exciting event. It was the first time that a black hole had been captured. It happened all thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope, which is many radio observatories or radio telescope facilities around the world, all working together to produce a highly sensitive and high-resolution telescope. Another array of telescopes in Chile is called the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA. They captured high-resolution images of the 51 significant galaxies in the Virgo cluster. That's part of how we know what we know. M87 and other galaxies don't appear to be doing a lot to the naked eye. In fact, in a typical human lifetime, they barely move at all. Yet, they are made up of gas, dust, and other objects that move through space at high speeds. They move when affected by the gravity of other galaxies, or dark matter, a mysterious entity that is five times more common than ordinary matter. Many galaxies, including our own, are believed to have a halo of dark matter surrounding them. The dark matter can pull more significantly on the smaller galaxies outside the clusters. As the galaxy gets dragged around through space, the star wrecker may come across. Giant clouds of intergalactic plasma, a form of electric gas, can behave like an atmosphere and drain the gas inside the galaxy. It sweeps out the gas inside the galaxy, stripping it of what it needs to make stars. It's hard to grasp the scale of this sort of activity, but that's what scientists now believe has been occurring to some galaxies or the nebulae without stars, as Charles Messier saw it. Now, let's park our space cruiser here and watch this thing in action. What we've been calling star wrecking is known as gas stripping. It's one of the most spectacular and violent external events in space. A scientist from the National Research Council of Canada said that galaxies are moving so fast through hot plasma in the cluster that a vast quantity of cold molecular gas is stripped from the galaxy. It's as though the gas is being swept away by a giant cosmic industrial blower. It's not the sort of clean out we want to happen in our galaxy. You observe it in action. You're impressed, but equally respectful of its great power. The gas stripping, also known as ram pressure stripping, travels through many galaxies and removes a star-forming gas. The process is very efficient. The gas is behaving differently from the clouds in our galaxy. They aren't forming as many stars as they are in ours. A 21st century study found that the same process happens in smaller groups of only a few galaxies, with much less dark matter. The study looked at a staggering 10,567 satellite galaxies. These are galaxies that exist beyond the enormous galaxy clusters. Most galaxies in the universe exist in between 2 and 100 galaxies. They were able to study such a large number by using stacking. It makes it possible to learn about a collection of faint objects by combining all the information from the objects and making an average characteristic. They ultimately determined that gas stripping, or star wrecking, is potentially the main way that galaxies, predominantly star formation, are shut down by their surroundings. Pretty unfortunate to have such a nasty neighbor. So, now that your curiosity has been satisfied, it's best to leave this plasma cloud and get on with your journey to Outpost 52. You're going to be late now and could be in a whole lot of trouble. While the cruiser turns around, we'll head back to Earth. And back in time, back to 1744, to that night in rural France where a teenager stood outside, marveling at the night sky and the spectacular vista of the six-tailed comet. And from that moment, was inspired to begin a lifelong quest based on a single question, perhaps the ultimate of all, what's out there? Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020, and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know, the signal is a bit irritating, 
and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther, 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. If you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower. Keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still. Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the Sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the Sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out, it just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. 
but it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm, heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. The maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert, something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire U.S. The biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy. Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart. But, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns, but the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe, at least that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige, or as they call it, cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds. And it needs to be comfortable. You'll need more space in there because you grow up to two inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit, which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For six feet, it's about two extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them, which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles. Now we all know that all planets are round. There are no square ones so far, and that's because of gravity. Well, roundish at least, as not all of the planets have perfect proportions. But did you ever wonder about the shape of the universe itself? Is it also round because of the same forces? Well, not really. Based on what information we have so far, the universe is actually… flat? According to the principles of general relativity, space has the ability to curve. This opens the door for the universe to have three potential shapes – a flat plane like a sheet of paper, a closed sphere like a bowl, 
or an open saddle-like curve. This isn't just a matter of academic interest, you know. The universe's shape has direct consequences on its ultimate destiny. One cosmologist from Princeton University explained it beautifully. The shape of the universe is a kind of map to its past and a predictor of its future. The questions of whether the universe will keep expanding forever or collapse at some point, and if it's finite or infinite, all circle back to the question of its shape. Now, to wrap your head around this cosmic question, you need to understand two key elements – the density of the universe and its rate of expansion. Let's dig into this a little. Around 68% of the universe is made up of dark energy, while 27% is dark matter. <laughs> the rest, which is normal matter, if you'd like, makes up the stars, planets, and other cosmic bodies we're familiar with. When we talk about the density of the universe, we're referring to the quantity of normal matter packed into a given volume of space. Now, if the universe is denser, it also has more gravity. In this case, the gravitational pull can overcome the force of expansion, so the universe curls up into a sphere. This shape is known as the closed model, where the universe ends up looking like a gigantic cosmic ball. Imagine a world that's finite but without boundaries – a contradiction for sure. In this model, an adventurous explorer could travel forever through space, never bumping into a wall or falling over an edge. Alternatively, if the density of the universe is low and not enough to halt the expansion, then space distorts in the opposite direction. This results in an open universe with negative curvature that resembles a saddle. You know, like on a horse. Despite these two potential scenarios, most scientists agree that the density of the universe is just right. Which means it expands proportionally without curving. But what does it mean if the universe is flat? It doesn't mean we're living in an infinite sheet of paper. To understand it, consider these analogies. Imagine you're in a square room, walk 10 steps to the next corner, make a 90-degree turn, walk another 10 steps, and repeat this process twice more. You end up back at your starting point, completing a square. Add another dimension to this geometry, since we're not 2D creatures, and whoopee, you have a flat universe. This analogy wouldn't hold up in a curved space. If you have a terrestrial globe at home, you might find it easier to understand this next experiment. Start by placing your finger at the Earth's equator, then trace a line to the North Pole, make a 90-degree turn, and return to the equator. Make one more 90-degree turn and walk back to your starting point. This journey only needed three turns, unlike the four turns in the flat universe scenario. Still struggling to understand? Here's another way to picture it. In a flat universe, two rockets traveling side by side will always remain parallel. This is in contrast to a closed universe, where the rockets will travel along the curve of space and eventually meet where they started. In an open universe with negative curvature, the rockets will gradually drift apart and never cross paths again. So is there a cosmological crisis at hand? It seems the answer to the shape of our universe is encoded in the cosmic microwave background, also named CMB which is like the universe's fossil record. Over the past few decades, scientists have measured temperature fluctuations in the CMB to find almost no curvature, indicating a flat universe. Now, the concept of a flat universe is crucial to the standard cosmological model. However, in late 2019, scientists from a university in Rome published a paper arguing that current CMB measurements actually indicate we're really living in a closed universe. How did they figure this out? Well, they looked at how light behaves in the universe. Specifically, they analyzed how light bends because of the gravitational force of matter in its path. Either way, apart from this finding, there's nothing else that would suggest we're living in a closed universe. Most scientists believe this recent discovery is nothing more than a statistical anomaly. But if the closed universe theory turns out to be right, it would shift decades of astronomical findings. 
If the universe is indeed curved, it must be so large that the observable 93 billion light years aren't enough to reveal its curvature. It could be similar to standing in a fog, only able to see a small, flat patch of land. Yet somewhere out of sight, the horizon reveals that we live on a sphere. As we continue to probe the cosmos, we might find that the apparent flatness of our universe is just a small part of a much larger, curved cosmos. Its shape is just one of the many things we've yet to figure out about the universe. We can't quite put our finger on why the universe is even here, for instance. We do have some theories, but scientists are yet to be sure. It could be that the universe is like a pop-up, materializing out of an unstable nowhere land. Imagine the emptiest emptiness you can think of, suddenly churning out matter and energy in equal and opposite amounts that tally up to zero. For most of us, it's hard to picture that process. If we follow this theory, who's to say there's only one universe? We might be just one of an enormous collection, a so-called multiverse. For now, we'll just have to wait for the next wave of cosmic measurements to refine our theories. And for scientists to come up with hypotheses that aren't just mathematically pretty, but actually testable. Also, how could we possibly know all the secrets of the universe if we don't completely understand our own biology yet? I mean, if we did, we could, theoretically, solve all of our health problems, right? We might even be able to play around with our DNA, like this molecular Lego, and give ourselves naturally purple hair or red fingernails. Well, time for a reality check, as we're still struggling with this one too. Here's a great example, our microbiome. Our bodies, home to 10 trillion human cells, are also an active city for 100 trillion microbial cells. That's a couple of pounds of bacteria and other microbes, which we absolutely can't do without. They've set up shop in our bellies, lungs, noses, and every other hidden nook and cranny. We're like luxurious cruise ships for these tiny microbial tourists, and we still don't fully understand the implications of this symbiotic relationship. There are still a lot of things we don't know about planet Earth, either. We've only ever dipped our toes into Earth's crust, never venturing more than a few miles deep. Everything else is our best guess, from remote sensing and smart physics. Believe it or not, it took us an embarrassingly long time to accept that the Earth's crust is constantly shifting, like Jenga pieces. We only warmed up to plate tectonics in the mid-20th century. We're also still trying to figure out precisely how the planet's inner engine works, and how the swirling, conducting materials in the outer core create our protective magnetic field. Plus, with 4.5 billion years of geological chaos, we're sometimes better off studying meteorites or the surfaces of other celestial bodies for clues about our planet's history. Even our faithful companion, the Moon, is a bit of a mystery. Was it born from a colossal collision or some other event? We're still not sure. But hey, the fact that we still have a lot to learn is what makes life interesting, isn't it? That, and the thrill of actually finding an empty parking spot in San Francisco. Or maybe even your city.